Hello class, welcome back. I hope you had a very nice week, week and a half break. So this week we are going to cover both week two and week three materials just because we missed that one week uh, going on our impromptu spring break. So I hope you enjoyed it. Hope you didn't have to work too much. Um, so week two covers a lot of privacy and security. It's the second half of our privacy and security topic. And then week three is going to cover more about filing systems, both paper and electronic health records. So let's first start off with a recap of last week or week one material. Um, so we talked a lot about privacy, about HIPAA regulations, um, what a covered entity is. And as a reminder, that would be somebody that is required to abide by HIPAA regulations. They could be somebody like a private office a hospital, an insurance company, a clearinghouse, and so on. There are certain circumstances where they do not have to abide by um, normal release of information regulations where they don't need to get that signed authorization, and that would be for TPO purposes, treatment, payment, and organization. So if there are is something that falls within that, say they're referring to another provider, they need, um, say the patient's in the emergency department and they need information on that patient um, urgently in order to treat them, that would be a circumstance. Payment information, it could be that they're, re they're sending that information to their insurance company, they don't need a signed authorization for that. For organizational, it could be filing the charts, um, they don't need signed authorizations for people that are working within the company in order uh, for them to view their medical records. Business associates are people that are contracted by those covered entities. They could be outside biller and coders. Um, they're also supposed to follow HIPAA regulations. The notice of privacy practices, we talked a lot about that, about patient rights and how they typically don't sit there and read the whole notice of privacy practices and oftentimes it means that they don't know their rights as patients. We also talked about breaches, what happens when they occur, what what obligations the practice has in order to notify on breaches, and what consequences that might have for the practice and the employees that caused the breaches. So that was a lot on privacy. This week we're going to talk a lot more about security. So HIPAA's security rule is enforced by the department, I see a typo there, Department of Health and Human Services, and within that, the Office of Civil Rights. The purpose of it is to prevent breaches of the protected health information to people that are not supposed to get it, unauthorized persons, and that includes electronic PHI, and oftentimes it is specifically talking about the, the breach of electronic health information. It's designed to be adaptable and scalable, which means that depending on the size of the practice and the size of the hospital, they can change their security rule and make it so that it fits the size of their practice. We also have what's called the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act of 2010, or ARRA. Its purpose was to increase the severity of penalties for breaches, and they are responsible for mandating the breach notification requirements. They incentivize the use of health information technology because they really want this uh, changeover from paper to electronic health records because they are really much more safe and secure as electronic PHI than they are in paper form. They also incentivize the use of certified electronic health record technology, that's C-E-H-R-T, and oftentimes they give financial incentives to providers who use that. They also have stipulations that make business associates more liable for breaches. So it is really important if you work as a business associate, especially if you are an external biller encoder for a company that you don't physically go to, say you're a remote biller encoder that's a contracted um, by a company. You are very much liable for breaches in HIPAA 
So it's really important that you follow all these stipulations. So security threats, there are three different types, human error, natural disasters, and intentional harm. Human error happens all the time. I mean, people are imperfect, so it's possible that they may send the wrong health information um, or that they might disclose information that was not supposed to be disclosed to a specific family member. These things happen, and they happen all the time, and we hear them in the news. There are a lot of guidelines in place in order to help prevent human error. Natural disasters also do occur. Um, things like hurricanes, think about places that are in like Florida around the coast. Those places that have all of their technology stored on computers that could be damaged and things like this. Flooding, um, things of that nature. All of these records could be destroyed, especially if they're paper. If they're backed up on a computer and they're stored elsewhere in a different state, that's the safest possible thing that they can do for their health records and to maintain them and protect them from these natural disasters. Intentional harm, we're talking about things like hackers, um, viruses, people who are intentionally trying to breach the system and distribute health information for their own gain. So there are a lot of safeguards in place, like I said. Um, there are a lot of administrative safeguards. Um, specific employees that they they hire in order to protect health information like a security officer in the office um, it could be contracted within each employee's contract that they have to abide by certain HIPAA regulations or there might be some consequences like termination guidelines for to follow like double and triple checking to make sure that the patient that you're talking to is the patient that you are viewing the chart, things of that nature. There are also physical and technical safeguards. We'll talk more about those as we go on. Technical safeguards, though, will be more things like firewalls and things to protect the computer itself from harm. Required standards and addressable standards. So required standards are, as it sounds, required by law that the practice or covered entity must follow. Addressable standards are, are standards that the provider has to de determine whether or not it's applicable to their practice. So sometimes there are standards that would not apply because maybe they're for specific biller encoders in the practice but maybe that provider doesn't have billers and coders in the practice. Maybe they send out their information to an external biller coder that's remote from a hired company. So they have to really determine whether or not those standards apply and um, what's best for their practice. So like I said, sometimes they'll hire a security officer. This could be anybody in the practice. Generally, it could be the, the office manager Sometimes it's even the provider themselves. They determine what guidelines are going to be in place, and they advise the administration, all the providers, what they should expect from their employees. They do risk assessment and risk acceptance to determine where their vulnerabilities lie and what can be in place to kind of combat those. They also develop and monitor certain security programs, and there's a reporting process where they generate reports and maybe report back to the whole office and tell them where they need to improve and how they're doing. So workforce security, with different companies, different employees might have different levels of access to PHI. So say the person that's at the front desk, the, the medical administrative assistant or the secretary, they might only have like an entry level access for being able to view scheduling software. Whereas somebody that's a medical assistant, a nurse, a doctor, they might have 
access to things like the patient record itself, being able to document um, the condition of the patient, the treatment, and so on. Whereas billing information, they might have access to, billers and coders might have access to the document that the doctor or nurse wrote, as well as any financial information, but they might not have access to the scheduling software. So really varying the access to appropriate levels of the PHI is really going to help with security. There should also be termination procedures in place for if a, an employee gets terminated from their job that their access to this information is also terminated immediately. So if they are feeling a little vindictive and they didn't like the way that they were treated or the way they were fired, that they don't lash out in a way and end up breaching information. So the purpose of risk assessment is to assess and reduce risk. So there might be policies and sanctions in place, um, policies to reduce risk and sanctions of what would happen to a person, what kind of consequences there might be if breaches occur. Information system activity review is a big component of this. So it, show, it would show the security officer who accessed what information and when. So that's a really good determining factor if you're trying to figure out who initiated a breach of a PHI. So threats and vulnerabilities. Vulnerabilities are places where there might be a lot of risk. There might be it's a weak spot in, in the security of the practice. Whereas threats are actual security threats, like somebody tried to send an email that included phishing information or viruses. Threats are taking advantage of the vulnerabilities of a practice. So the purpose of that security officer is to reduce the amount of vulnerabilities a practice has and try to prevent these threats to the practice. So all documentation revolving around um, security training should be retained for six years as required by HIPAA. There should be um, any security training that is in place is usually provided by the security officer. It should cover any policies that are in place in the practice, as well as um, how to manage their passwords and making sure that we're logging out every time that we leave the computer, or at least locking it. One main thing is that people have very secure passwords, that the password is not password, or their birthday, something that's easily guessed or identifiable. Also making sure that there's physical and workstation security, that there are safeguards so that, you know, somebody off the street wouldn't be able to just walk in and use the computer. So contingency plans are in place in case the data systems are down and the practice still needs to function. So redundancy is in place in case, say, but the Wi-Fi, the Wi-Fi might be down, but the internet's not. So you could plug in your computer and make it not wireless anymore, but it might still be able to function. Business continuity plans are in place in case all systems are down, there's no way you can use the internet. Maybe there's paper records that are paper copies of the things that you normally put into the computer. So you might be able to write things down and function in that capacity. And then data recovery, you could take that information and input it into the computer or recover any data that might have been lost during this outage. Authentication can come in many different forms. It can come in the form of a password or an identity 
an individual identifier like a pin. Again, making sure that those are not very simple and easy to recognize. Using a smart card or token, those usually occur in things like the VA, the Veterans Affairs Hospitals. They generally use the smart cards or tokens in order to log into their computers. They put them right into the keyboard and they are able to then use another additional password or pin on top of that. Biometrics uses a specific biological identifier, things like retina scanners, fingerprint, face identifiers. Those will use biometrics and that way it's somebody without the, that information would be completely unable to access the information that you have. Encryption is a way of sending information across information systems, like maybe between different computers, in a safe way so that it can't be intercepted and used in a breach. There are two different types of encryption, symmetric and asymmetric. Symmetric has a secret key that is able to take that information that is jumbled into letters and numbers and put it into a readable format. With asymmetric, it has a public key that does the same thing. There are lots of different types of malicious software. Viruses infect the computer itself. It usually comes in the form of something that you have to download. Same with worms, but worms like to infect computers that are in a network. So say you're in a hospital setting and you download something that was an attachment from an email and it contained a worm. The worm could then infect all of the computers in the hospital. So those can be really dangerous. Bots can be also um, downloaded and those gather information. So those are really um, dangerous in things like breaching information because they can take all the information from your the things that you're looking at. Say you're looking at a patient chart, it can gather that information and release it. Spyware is very similar in that sense, but it can also track keystrokes and passwords so that it can log in even when you're not using the computer. Ransomware can also gather information, but it uses, it, it asks for money in return. So this could be somebody like a hacker that has gathered a bunch of health information from a hospital and they're asking for a ransom in order to not release it. If you've seen Grey's Anatomy, this is an actual episode in Grey's Anatomy in one of the, the most recent seasons. Trojans, uh, they appear as legitimate software. Maybe you're looking to download a software for some purpose. Um, and the website looks the same and everything, but you download it and that's actually a Trojan. And it can cause a lot of damage to the information systems. So there's a difference between security events and security incidents. A security event has not led to any harm, but a security incident has led to harm. So an example would be somebody writing down their password on a sticky note and putting it right onto their computer, sticking it right to the computer monitor. If nobody has seen that password or they've seen it but not used it, that would be a security event because harm could come from that but it hasn't yet. A security incident would be somebody seeing that password, using it to log in through their user ID, and then using it for harmful reasons in order to disseminate this PHI that was supposed to be protected. So there are a lot of procedures in place when security incidents do occur. They have to report any attempted or successful unauthorized access to the company itself. There's forensics in place to figure out who accessed what in order to kind of get down and to the bottom of it and figure out all the evidence. Spoliation is the intentional destruction of evidence. So if somebody went through and 
was able to access the information system that logs who accessed what and they deleted their information, that would be spoliation. And mitigation efforts involve plans in place in order to make it up to whoever's information was released. Maybe they'll offer them like a monetary fee or a monetary amount in order to make it up to them that they their social security number was released and they possibly will be a victim of identity fraud. Like that doesn't seem like a good mitigation effort, but this is oftentimes what practices or hospitals will do. So, like I said, the Office of Civil Rights, the OCR, is what's responsible for maintaining all of these security threats. They're going to investigate any complaints that might happen. They're going to conduct compliance reviews to make sure everybody is on the same page. And they even do education and outreach to ensure that everybody's up to date on all of the newest compliance regulations by the OCR and the HHS. So civil penalties. This is a case of non-compliance with the practice with no resolution. So there was a breach. The practice did no attempt to try to resolve it. So if they were unknowing, the penalty range could be $100,000 to $50,000 per violation. And it goes up to a maximum of $1.5 million if there was willful neglect. So that was civil penalties. Criminal penalties are handled by the Department of Justice. So the OCR is no longer involved. They can face from 1 to 10 years in prison, and they can also have those those same fines from the civil penalties. So that's all for security. We're going to kind of shift gears now for the week three lecture, and it's going to be more about the assembly, retrieval, and maintenance of health records, starting with paper records and going on into electronic health records and the information systems that are in place. So for medical record filing, there are a lot of different techniques that you can use to file medical records that are paper records within a practice. Oftentimes you'll see alphabetical filing by the patient's last name. There's also straight numerical filing, which is in chronological order. And there are three different types of those. The unit numbering system, the serial unit numbering system, and the serial numbering system. And then there's also terminal digit filing and middle digit filing. So we'll talk about each of those more in depth. So the serial numbering system is where a patient receives a different number every time they are seen. So every time they go to the hospital, they receive a different medical record number. So they could have, you know, as many medical record numbers for as many times as they're seen, and that could be really confusing when it comes to looking at a patient's medical records. It would be really easy to miss something. The serial unit numbering system is where a patient gets a new medical record every time they're seen, but their past records are also brought forward and linked with their most recent record. So that's really helpful. Um, but that being said, in all of these numbering systems that we've talked about so far, with serial unit numbering and also serial numbering, which are part of the straight numerical filing, they're being filed by the patient's medical record number. So that's kind of dangerous when you think about it because those are being displayed. They could be displayed in an open filing system where they could be viewed. They can also be filed according to a unit numbering system where the patient is only assigned one medical record number which will carry on throughout all visits. This is definitely more common than the other two of the straight numerical filing systems. So the advantages for this is that they increase patient confidentiality to an extent. So they increase patient confidentiality to the in the way that they're not being filed by the patient's actual name. 
but their medical record number is still out there. It allows for easy retrieval because it's all the numbers are listed in chronological order. So as long as you know where those numbers are within the filing system, you can find them pretty easily. The training for this for the medical records personnel would be pretty simple. Teaching them, I mean, people already know how to count, so as long as they know that, they can put these records in order. It also, it mainly works well with small filing systems, because as you can imagine, anything that goes beyond a certain digit would be kind of hard to file. Like, it might be difficult to file numbers that go beyond six digits. It does make purging pretty easy because, as you can imagine, they may have been the doctor's, one of the doctor's first patients, but it, maybe they haven't been seen or they're no longer a patient of the doctor, and they can purge several sections of medical records in that way. There's also called what's called terminal digit filing. So the last two digits of a of a number would mark the chart's location. So in the terminal digit filing there's six it's a six digit number that's separated in twos by hyphens. And you would file according to the last two digits. So it's a lot easier to find than finding a whole six unit number. So you'd only look for the 65. But wait, what if there are multiple ones that end in 65? Then you would go to the secondary number. You would go to the middle number and determine it that way. Say the, the whole number ends in both 14 and 65. Then they would go to the first two digits and that would be called the tertiary number and no number will be all the same in all six digits. Middle digit filing is very similar, so instead you would file by the middle two digits. And then if the middle digits are the same for two numbers, you would look at the, the first two digits next. If those digits are the same, then you refer to the last two digits. So with these, they're easily color-coded. Um, they are more complicated, so they may require more training. But this also allows for a lot more patient confidentiality. Because whether you do terminal digit filing or middle digit filing, the most laypersons would not know which filing system you were using. So it allows for a lot more... Uh, confidentiality. Plus, it's not just the patient's medical record numbers. It's a random set of digits that they're assigned. Open shelving is the most common way that uh, medical professionals display their paper records. It's really good for increasing accessibility and visibility so that you can just go over and pick out a chart. It's not in the hefty filing cabinet that's filled with charts and hard to view. They're all, it's also a lot cheaper to store medical records this way and you can even store them in a locker in which you can close at the end of the day and lock it. <clears throat> Sometimes they can even be stored as microfilm or microfiche both of which would be in either a film or a paper format like shown in this picture below. And in this way you can save paper because you can transfer the paper data to be easily viewed on these microform machines. However, these are kind of outdated and uh, oftentimes you only see these in places like libraries. I've never actually seen any medical providers that use these in their office but they could be used for, for more outdated records. So switching gears here to the electronic health records. So paper records is what we just talked about. Paper records aren't very much used anymore, but they still are used in some capacities. Some people are transferring from paper to electronic still, 
And that can be a long process, especially for these bigger practices in hospitals. So clinical information systems are information systems within a computer or any health information technology that can be used to store information for a specific purpose. So the different clinical information systems that we're going to talk about in detail are listed below. The document management system, radiology information system, laboratory information system, nursing information system, pharmacy information system, cardiology information system, interdisciplinary charting, emergency department system, anesthesia information system, patient monitoring system, telehealth, and smart cards. So we'll talk about each of those in more detail. Possibly the biggest one that we'll talk about is this document management system or the DMS. It's going to collect and manage, document, manage documents from all other information systems. So any, this could include any paper documents. Maybe um, you, you had a technology failure within the practice and part of your con contingency plan was to create um, paper documentation. You could then scan that documentation into the computer and use it as part of the patient's chart. This would be included in the document management system. It's not the same as electronic health records, however, because electronic health records are going to cover the patient's entire medical records from, from any of its providers that they've seen. The document management system is only going to have scanned documents, um, documents that are supporting the electronic health record. The document management system management system can also be used to help workflow. So in cases of chart completion, document release, say um, a patient needed to sign an authorization in order for their medical information to be released to another provider, that information would be on a piece of paper and they could scan that into the computer. They can also use this system to annotate documents and have physicians electronically sign charts in order to make them valid and available for coding and billing. There's also this relatively new technology called Optical Character Recognition, OCR, where you can scan text and you can put it into a computer system and it can be edited. So that's really cool because um, without that, you would you could you could scan information into a computer system, but it would not be able to be edited. It would be in a PDF format. It would be almost like you scanned in an image of it. So it's cool that they came up with a technology where you can actually edit that information. So the advantage of, advantages of DMS is that it's good for space saving. I mean, imagine all of the paper records that they can do without due to having all of that information scanned into a computer. It also allows for the quick retrieval of records. You don't have to sift around all these papers, looking at all these charts to find try to find the right information that you're looking for. It's only a couple of clicks and keystrokes away. It's also more secure. There are a lot of safeguards on the computers. Um, we talked a lot about authentication and all these different ways that somebody trying to access this information would have to bypass in order to get to it, rather than just going into a chart and picking it out. It's also more efficient for quality control. A lot of reports can be generated from the documentation management system so they can see how efficient all of your, their employees are being. Implementing a DMS can take a long time, especially if somebody is just turning over from paper to electronic health records. It requires a lot of back scanning, so a lot of taking those paper records and scanning them into the computer, and sometimes records can be huge. So it could take a really long time to scan these in, which could result in a lot of staffing changes. Somebody that may have re previously been a medical record specialist, somebody who would pull records and make sure that they're put back in place and categorized. If a 
practices changing over from paper to electronic health records, they might be losing their job eventually because it's no longer needed. But in the meantime, they might be tasked with doing this whole back scanning process of taking all of these records and putting them into the computer. There's a lot of cost justification in mind when implementing a DMS. It will save them a lot of money in the long run, just in employees alone, <clears throat> but it can be expensive to implement in software charges and all of the technology that is needed, like scanners and printers and these computer systems. There also might be a form redesign in mind when thinking about scanning information into a computer system. A lot of the times when scanning information they might have barcodes right on the front of the document that they're going to scan and it might tell the scanner different specifications that they have for how it should be scanned. So it simplifies the process and makes it run much quicker. So there's a lot of discussion on what charts, when charts should be scanned. Some say immediately following discharge because this allows more people to be able to access them right away. But oftentimes when the patient is discharged, the chart is not completed. So if they're, they're scanned in before they're completed, there might be a lot of stuff missing that has to be annotated later on. So many say that scanning upon completion might be better even though they have to wait a little bit longer in order to access that information. Components of the DMS include scanners, very obviously, because that's the main part of it, right? Scanning these documents into a computer system. They include what's called target sheets, and the target sheets are going to have these barcodes on them. That, and they're essentially going to be these title sheets that tells whoever's reading this information what they should expect, what, what they're going to be reading. There will be a scanning workstation, which is oftentimes the computer that's utilized that it, the scanner sends the information to, and then that computer assigns a file name. There's also an abstracting and quality control station, and that will usually involve a human, and they're going to abstract and ensure that all of the information that was sent over looks good and is readable. There will be a file server which has a powerful memory. It's usually some sort of external computer that has a hard drive that's going to store all of this information. There's a retrieval workstation where you can view these images. There's usually authorization required because not everybody should be viewing all of these medical records. And then there's also printers involved. Also, sorry if you can hear my dog in the background. I'm recording this from home. And I have a puppy, and she is very active right now. Annotation is also a big part of the DMS. They don't annotation does not alter the images themselves. It it is over top of the image, so you can actually take the annotations off if necessary. Um, it allows notes to be added. Maybe um, the office manager would put in place something that said uh, Dr. So-and-so needs to sign here. They can highlight specific things. So that's all document management system. Next is the radiology information system, the RIS. And that's used to collect and store information about radiology tests, things like x-rays, ultrasounds, CAT scans, MRIs, things of that nature. <clears throat> so it will store the images themselves as well as any administrative things, like if people need to be scheduled for an x-ray, <clears throat> if they need to receive results. The RIS has what's called a Picture Archival Communication System, or PACS. 
and it has the digital storage of the images and allows them to be viewed from anywhere immediately. These are generally filmless. They are filmless so that you can view them electronically and the image can be manipulated. So this is really great for radiologists who re work remotely so they can view the images from anywhere and be able to work up a report from that. The Laboratory Information System, or LIS, is for collecting and storing information about laboratory tests and results. They, they can be viewed from anywhere, which is great for physicians who need to make a diagnosis quickly. They're also important for administrative tasks, like scheduling people for different laboratory tests. And they also have a clinical provider entry system, which allows doctors or physicians or medical specialists to order these tests directly and they're sent straight to this laboratory information system and they're ordered. The nursing information system or NIS is going to document all nursing care of patients. It's the nurses documentation system and it has an administrative tasks as well as far as ordering or administering medications um, and if like a patient needs certain things at certain times. The pharmacy information system is important for ordering and delivering medications. It can determine um, any drug interactions or check dosages, so it can alert the pharmacist if there is a problem with the prescription. Say a patient's already taking a medication and they shouldn't take the medication that was prescribed with their current medications because it could cause like a life-threatening reaction, then they'll be notified of that through the system. It also manages inventory, which is extremely important in the pharmacy setting because they don't want to run out of certain drugs that are really important for managing someone's life or chronic condition. The cardiology information system, or CIS, is going to manage cardiac images and services. Things like EKGs and echocardiograms, it'll store all of these images. It also has administrative functions, as the, all the other ones do, as far as scheduling these tests and so on. There's what's called an interdisciplinary charting system, where providers of all different disciplines can chart in the same area so that they can see all these different providers um, and how they're interacting with the same patient. This is very common with, within the VA system with veterans because they do have such interdisciplinary care. They see a lot of providers, so it's good to be able to see um, how these patients are being treated. There's an emergency department system which will track patients from triage to discharge. So the moment they enter the building to the moment they leave the building, they're getting tracked within this emergency department system. So it has a lot of characteristics that are specific to the ED. And it can also manage workflow, which will be important for um, determining how they can make the emergency department more efficient, how much staff they need at specific times, and so on. The anesthesia information system is going to collect information about um, anesthesia that's delivered through the operation process, either post-op, during operations, or after operations. And it'll collect information and determine um, different statistics based on that. It collects information regarding patients' vitals, um, their dosages, and so on. Patient monitoring systems are going to collect and store patient data. This can You'll often see these in hospitals um, if you're hooked up to a monitoring system. They're the things that are constantly beeping and are telling you what your pulse and your heart rate is and your oxygen saturation. Babies are often hooked up to these too so that you can see um, how they're doing when they're first born or fetal monitoring during pregnancy to see what their heart rate's like. Telehealth is really important, especially in the last couple of weeks, because it provides information between patient and provider from a distance. So you, you can talk to your doctor through 
like a FaceTime call or through your computer. It improves access to care, um, but it's important that you know that doctors can usually only work within the scope of their state, so it's not that you can see every doctor. You have to try to find somebody that's within your state or area because that's where they're licensed. This also includes home monitoring systems like blood glucose, um, blood pressure, things like that when patients have chronic conditions that have to be monitored. And those techno that technology can send that information straight to this telehealth system where the doctor can easily view it and keep track of it. This also helps with things like telesurgery. Um, doctors can, can perform surgery from a remote location using the help of robots and robotic technology. Smart cards are a lot like credit cards. They contain a chip and they have a portable storage of health information. A lot of times if a patient has a chronic condition or an allergy, they might carry something like this. And they but some can require passwords or pins if they have protected health information. This can be really important in things like life-threatening emergencies when patients can't tell a provider something um, if they're unconscious or something along those lines. And they come in two different forms, contact or contactless. Contact would be if you had to insert this card into something. Contactless is if you would have to tap it or just have it nearby a system in order for it to recognize it. So the HIM professional, um, anybody that's going to be interacting with this technology and is the managing it, while they don't manage these actual information systems, they do access a lot of this information. They're in charge of the privacy and security of all of this information and also of updating a charge master, which is going to have all of the codes that are generally used within that practice and what the fee schedule is like, so what the doctor normally charges for it and what the insurance is actually cover. So this week, um, your week one assignments are due by Thursday, March 26th at midnight. Week two and three assignments are going to be due by next Thursday, April 2nd at midnight, and that'll put us back on track. For um, Then we'll do just one a week after that. Your chart assembly project is due next week. And just a little bit about that because it is one of your bigger projects. It's worth a lot of your grade. Your chart assembly project is going to be where you're going to look at a practice's current assembly of their charts and how they assemble them in a paper records and how they file them. And you're going to take that information from a private practice and make a filing system for a long-term care facility because the doctors are changing from a private practice to a long-term care facility. So there's an example of a veteran's affairs hospital on there that is a long-term care facility. So you're going to kind of merge those together because the doctors really like their current filing system. So you'll find kind of a, a good median between those. So let me know if you have any questions on that. Um, we don't have to set up our AHIMA stuff just yet. So if you're still in the process of getting your code, that's perfectly fine. Again, let me know if you have any questions. I'm available to set up a Skype or a FaceTime call or even talk on the phone if you have anything that you want to review or that you're having trouble with.